Hello, welcome once again to Pale Blooms and Beyond. Thank you for joining us today. Joey Gregorash is a Canadian singer, songwriter, and musician from Winnipeg, Manitoba. In 1965, Joey started his musical adventure as a founding member of the Mongrels. Originally the drummer, Joey moved to Oregon and lead vocals. The band would release five singles during the late 60s and early 70s. After his time in the Mongrels, Joey was signed to Polydor Records, where he released two solo albums, 1971's North Country Funk and 1973's Tell the People. Two of Joey's biggest hits were Jody and a cover of Neil Young's Down by the River. Mr. Gregorash was the first solo act from Manitoba to win a Juno Award for Outstanding Performance by a Male. In 1987, my guest released his third album, Together. From the late 80s to the early 90s, Joey hosted a children's TV show called Skittle Bits. Today, Joey Gregorash is still performing live, and he's hosting an event right in time for my birthday, Joey's Salute to the 60s on July 10th, and my birthday is the following day on the 11th. <laughs> well, welcome, Joey. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. <laughs> That's a smart thing in your <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Uh, well, uh, you're looking spry, young lad. That's okay. Thank you. Very, oh, it's very kind. Very kind. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you'll have to add that at the end of the show. <laughs> <laughs> there might be a fee by that time. Okay. Right. Here. <laughs> got, got you. Uh, well, well, welcome, Joey. Thank you for doing this. I uh, for your interest. We'll take us back to the beginning. Uh, where were you born? Uh, Winnipeg. Always, uh, always, uh, you know, wherever I went in, uh, you know, in my uh, musical journey or career, I always came back to Winnipeg. And uh, it's uh, it's it's not a uh, it, you know it's it, it's it's not being mean to say for me Winnipeg is like a comfortable old shoe, and okay. yeah I, I I I've been very lucky you know to call this my home because of the careers that started here uh, we lived through the best era that we'll no doubt be talking about with the mongrels and that's where my musical career started really right and, right. Well, I'm um, a native Dallasite and mostly live my, you know, life around, in and around Dallas, so I can relate to that. Well, yeah. uh, talk about some uh, fond childhood memories and uh, in particular uh, music that you might have heard in the household. Well, you know, I guess the uh, the memories, the, the, the biggest one really would be the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, uh, which inspired a lot of us. Uh, you know, because that time, uh, my whole life has been sports and music. I, I, I could never decide between the two. You know, I thought maybe at one point I wouldn't mind being a professional athlete. But when the Beatles came out and saw them, mm -hmm. well, ladies and gentlemen, here they are from Transcona. The <laughs> uh, and <laughs> and funny, uh, when that happened, it was uh, it was magic. I I was taken by just Ringo Starr was just so cool and you know the way he, his style he was so uh incredibly tasty as far as his you know his drum licks and everything like that so uh I took up drum lessons uh with a fellow by the name of Del Wagner who okay. was just a wonderful wonderful teacher and uh, it, it turned out to be kind of an uh, ironic, like, you know, connection because I took up, uh, you know, drumming and then I was the mongrels drummer. We started, I started uh, as the drummer. Yeah. And um, that was, I was so cool. My first uh, set was uh, Beltone, uh, Beltone drums uh, and they were mismatched set. And then I got <laughs> to a sonar set. And was that ever cool? That was, you know, red and black. Uh, trimmed and and the snare was the envy of all the other drummers, you know, in the in the area, the weekend musicians, and um, so one. I was a drummer for you know a couple of years. That we started John Nikon and I uh, started Mongrels in around 1965, and Jeff Marin was our lead singer, 
and there was John Hart, John Nikon, and John McGinnis, uh, and yours truly. And so one night, we, we were playing, you know, a lot of community clubs, and the band did, you know, uh, morph into other members of the band. And one night, our there was about 45 minutes before Maple's Community Club, we were uh, doing a dance there. And... Uh, the the lead singer's uh, older brother showed up and said, okay, mom and dad warned you, you know, <laughs> your school marks had to come up. You're out of the band. You're, and we went, well, his name was Dave, his, his brother. And we went, Dave, we've got a gig in 45 minutes. We've got to dance, you know, and this is backstage. And he said, nope, too bad. He's been warned. I, mom, uh, My mom and dad, you know, mom and dad sent me here to pick him up. Uh, in his green Studebaker, <laughs> remember those? <laughs> and we're going, oh, what are we going to do? So Duncan Wilson, the lead player at that time, uh, said, well, Joey, you, you know, you've sort of been singing along, so you must know some of the songs. And I went, I'll try, I'll do my best. And the first song I ever sang, uh, and still, you know, uh, as, a, as a singer and a drummer was Route 66. Oh, is that right? Okay. And I did not know the words. So it was like, if you, if pound more wealth, you know, I have no idea. But, you know, just fanatics, you know, close as I could get. And so we we struggled through that night. We the, the song I used to do solo was Hang On Sloopy. We probably did that three times saying, oh, we've had a request to do this again. Again. <laughs> so we told them, we, somehow we got through it. And so um, when we had a meeting, uh, okay, what do we do now? Yeah. Uh, Duncan, uh, Duncan said, why don't we get, uh, why don't you become the lead singer and we'll get a drummer? Coincidentally, the drummer was Larry Rasmussen, who took lessons after I did with Del Wagner. But Larry was really good. Oh. He was, he, like he'd been drumming a lot longer than I, that's all he did was, you know, the drums, there was no other interest. He wasn't a singer or anything. He just solely played drums and he was unbelievable. And his, if you listen to some of the early mongrel stuff like My Woman or Funny Day, some of the licks, even sitting in the station, some of the licks that he puts in are so smooth. It, it I, I don't know how he was, he put those licks in. He was so, so incredibly good. So yeah. I became the lead singer, learned all the words to Route 66. <laughs> and that's how, that would be the best edition of the Mongols with okay. uh, Wilson, Garth Nosworthy, John Nikon, uh, you know, uh, myself. And uh, who am I missing? Larry. Yeah. Okay. And that oh, turned out well, to be let me Okay. Oh, go okay. ahead. Go ahead. No, that, you, that became the one of the top bands in Winnipeg. That version of oh. them. Oh, and oh. Uh, then we we went. We were lucky to record uh, some Randy Backman uh, written yes. songs. Were right. Old, right. And I'm going down to uh, Minis, uh, yeah, Minneapolis, and recording at Sound 80 with Tommy Young, who became a huge uh, known producer. And right. so we, did, uh, we did four songs. Uh, yeah. that, uh, I know. I noticed that. Yeah, Randy. That, that Randy Bachman did write a few of the tracks, or co-wrote. Co-wrote also. Well, yeah. who else? Let me ask you. Uh, besides, like Chad Allen and the Expressions, what other bands were a part of the Winnipeg scene around oh, that time? Uh, uh, you know, how much time <laughs> do you have? I mean, <laughs> I, mean, I got lots of time. <laughs> no, we, were, we were the mecca. Of, okay. of all across Canada as far as bands. And I always like to say that I wish the kids today could have what we had because okay. it's a community club dance, uh, two of them every weekend. Sometimes there'd be a Thursday night gig somewhere, but it was the beehive of acti activity in all of Canada. We were the mech. I even later on in life, uh, bands, I, 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 when I became an MC for the casinos of Winnipeg, bands would ask me was it that exciting you know like the, the stampeders came through with five man electrical oh. band, like that, and they'd said yeah we heard all about winnipeg and was it oh, i said oh man it was incredible it, it, it just was such a great time so we went down to 
uh, Sound 80 in Minneapolis. Tommy Jung was the engineer and we recorded. And, then, and Randy was there too. I believe, uh, if memory serves me right, he did play on one of the tracks and I believe it was um, Sitting in the Station. Or it could have been that one or My Woman, but I know that he contributed something. And uh, the, the, the songs did very well regionally. Regionally, they did, you know, my favorite was My Woman I, because it, it sounded so British. Very yes. British, yes. You know, you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, sit there and talk like Paul McCartney, you know, it's like you're there, but you're not there. <laughs> so, yes. um, <laughs> yeah, it was uh, it yeah. was quite the time. But the interesting thing about that, we did we did four songs, and then, you know, as as you all probably have known through interviews, uh, a band is is like like a marriage, and sometimes you know right. things go a little rocky. And right. we were supposed to go to Los Angeles, and uh, I was waiting. Yeah, we all were uh, for you know something to happen, and things didn't happen and then we heard that it might not have happened the way we would have wanted it then there was kind of you know a little bit of strife in the band and john uh john and i were the original mongrels and we both had a chat one day and, and john said you know i've got a i've got a chance to get a job in, with uh you know the rail uh, railway canadian uh, railway and uh i said you know if it's an opportunity, you got to take it, John. You know, we 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 didn't know anything would happen, and uh, so he he took the job and he had to go to Thunder Bay, so he was out of the band. And then I caught uh, a really bad throat infection, and we were supposed to play at uh, the St. James Civic Center coming up, and I had to go to a doctor. I still remember Maurice, Doctor Maurice Pierce, and he treated Barbara Streisand. Oh. He was well known. And our manager got on the phone saying he's got to, you know, he's got to play, you know, whatever. And I, he said, "Look, oh, fella, he, he can't. He's in. He's in my office. His throat's on fire. Who is this?" And I'm going, "My manager." <laughs> and they said, well, "I don't care who you are, fella. He's not saying he's, you know, seventy-two hours of silence." Oh, you know, <laughs> and then it just went south from there. And so I left. I left the band after that. Now the interesting thing is. When when I left, I was uh, they got a fellow by the name of Alan Schick. Now Alan had um, a couple of hits by his name. I think Lucy 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 was one of his hits. But he became the lead singer of the Mongrels. And as Duncan said, when Joey left, we became the Beatles because Alan Schick had a little bit of a Paul McCartney kind of look. Okay. But he started doing. Uh, they recorded some songs. There was one called "Do You Know Your Mother." And it was, do you know your mother? It was almost like very Beatle-like. And uh, it, 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 they did okay, but they went down to, I believe it was Chicago. RCA signed them. RCA mm -hmm. signed them. And they did an album that was never released. Mm -hmm. Never. It's still somewhere in the archives of Is RCA. Right? Yeah, the mom, right? Yeah. With Alan, yeah, yeah. So we never, never heard anything, you know, uh, uh, about uh, any release of any of the songs, and it's still somewhere in the archives. I wish that somebody could find it and and release it. Right, it good, uh, you know, in the recording. Studio. Right. Well, maybe somebody will watch this and get in, get in touch with you. Yeah. Or, you know, it was you know. RCA in Chicago. That's yeah. That's where yeah. it was. So. You know, hopefully, yeah. maybe somebody knows the mongrels RCA. Yeah. That uh, was appreciated. Yeah. yeah, that would be worthwhile. Yes. Yeah, uh, hearing sure. that release, releasing that. Well, well, uh, yeah. You you touched on two of my favorite tracks, uh, "My Woman." Yeah, definitely. I, I love. You know, and it's interesting because that was like an earlier track. Uh, a lot of bands, they their first tracks are kind of a little more raw and not as polished. But I think that's your that's that was your best track, you know, I, coming out I, early. Now, yeah, yeah. the the interesting thing there is, and I appreciate your comments on that. That, that is my favorite. The interesting thing is that it wasn't our most successful. The most successful was "Funny Day," yeah, uh, yeah. which was which made American Bandstand. Yeah, they, 
Yeah. They, I don't know if you remember it when they did rate the record. Yeah, and, I, yeah uh, I can vaguely. Yeah. Uh, so it was a Saturday afternoon. And uh, we're all, you know, we, we had a gig that night at River Heights Community Club. It was the mecca of gigs when you played. <laughs> that was the biggie. And uh, so we're watching American Bandstand. And there's Dick Clark saying, and now here's a band from Canada. And we're all like, we couldn't believe it. It's called Funny Day. Let's have a listen. You know, so they played Funny Day. And then afterward, they talked to, you know, the kids, you know, okay, so how did you rate this record? And we got a failing grade. We got a... So we went to River Heights Community Club uh, the, the, that night, you know, the, it was always packed at River Heights. And so when we got to that part of the show, I went... Okay, we'd like to do a song right now, uh, written by, you know, co-written by Randy Bagman. It's called Funny Day. And in the audience, kids were going, eh. <laughs> <laughs> they did that. <laughs> but we, they, they did it good. You know, they were they applaud after. So we knew they were only kidding. But, you know, yeah. to even get on American Bandstand, with, I mean, we were a local local band. So yeah. that was that was quite an accomplishment. Yeah. But, well, so, well, I like I, I like funny I like funny day, but I prefer my woman. I'm uh, really yeah. surprised that wasn't a bigger a bigger hit or bigger. Yeah, well, there was actually uh, my woman was also released by a group uh, in Winnipeg at the time called the Eternals. So okay. they had my woman out, and we had my woman. This wow. this same song. Theirs was more, if, if you will, and I don't mean disrespect. It was more stilted. It wasn't that free flowing that, you know, my woman is beautiful, right? Theirs was kind of on the beat, you know, yeah. um, and it wasn't, I, I, I really, really thought our version was better and so did a lot of people. They, they preferred our version of my woman and right. uh, yeah, it, it, it's always been my favorite. Yeah. yeah. And the other track uh, you mentioned earlier too, the B-side to Death of a Salesman. Sitting in the station, sitting in the station, co written by, by uh, Randy Bond. Sitting yeah. in the station was written uh, specifically for a Tom Jones wannabe. Okay. Oh. That the, we, we changed it. We, we actually changed it. I had the idea and I sang it for Randy uh, and he said, Yeah, let's, let's do it that way. Because the, um, our version was, here I sit, I'm the only one sitting here down on platform one. The last train is gone. Like that. The song was actually written. Here I sit, I'm the only one sitting <laughs> here down on platform one. You know, it was very, very Tom Jones on a beat. And that's the way that it was originally written. We changed it. And um, it was good for us that way. And it was good to... Uh, it, it sort of held us over for the next single, which was My Woman. Yeah. And um, My Woman did well. And then Funny Day eh, went to... Um, <laughs> right. Justin, I will be very honest with you. I hated it. I, I just... You know, <laughs> have a and he never made a sale. <laughs> I just... <laughs> we had some amp feedback at the beginning, and I'm going, well, you know, what's going on? Uh, uh, never, you, yeah. Had you ever, you, you, Willie, you know, right? Your your good uh, impressionist too. Had you ever thought about that as a second career, uh, doing well, impression? I, you know, if this one fails, I, I'll probably have to do that and ride off into the sunset. And now there, <laughs> Joey Grimm. How do you, how do you say? It? <laughs> that was that was another <laughs> the years with Polly. Uh, uh, where yeah, you know, well, here's somebody from Winnipeg called Joey Gregorash. Like, Come on, <laughs> so that's why we dropped. There was a, a violinist, a, a fiddle player here. His name was Jim Greg Grash, G R E G R A S H, and we oh. suspected that he dropped the O because he was getting the same, and he was no relation. Now, I'll tell you a funny story, not a funny story, it, was, it shook me up, but I uh, I was home one day and uh, I got a phone call and uh, the guy, I don't know who it was to this day, and he said, is this uh, Joey? And I said, yeah. He said, I'm really sorry to hear about your father. What? <laughs> he said, well, 
uh, have you not heard? Because this just happened. I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. He said, well, he committed suicide. I went, what? Uh, 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 I'll call you back. <laughs> I didn't know who it was. You know, I'm right. dying. My Ridiculous. dad, you, my dad uh, answered. So I went, dad? Yeah. Dad? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you okay? <laughs> you're talking to me. <laughs> so it, <laughs> it was Jim that oh, unfortunately, okay. yeah, took his own life. So oh. that, was, that was a bit of a, a shakeup. So we did the same thing, really, when I got, got my recording contract, because, you know, I said, why don't we just drop the O and eliminate all this Gregorash, uh, you know, yeah. to grab, you know, that's yeah. a lot of people pronounced it anyway. Okay. Gregor, you know, you, sometimes you don't even hear the O. So right. but that would help. And uh, it turns out it was kind of a kind of a mistake. We should have just gone with it. I right. mean, Chantal Kreviasek can tell you it was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> was good for her. It was terrific. You know, she stuck with it. Too. No, no, that's my name. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Well, I want to ask you, after you left uh, the Mongrels, you were with a group, the group Walrus for a short yeah. period. Not not right away. Uh, you, you know, you always kind of, you know, you miss it. As, as uh, Garth Brooks said, you know, when you get in show, man, it's like a drug. You know what I'm saying? It's just like a drug. Just get yeah. Shut up. <laughs> yeah. Not a drug. Here's another term. Alcohol. No. <laughs> um, so it does. And I... We formed Walrus with uh, a fellow that wrote a lot of the, the stuff with me, Ron Risco, uh, Brian Mac McMillan, and uh, another Brian, Brian Long. And there was uh, just the four of us uh, in in the group. And we 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 sort of started at the, t the tail end of community clubs because what happened was they lowered the drinking age to 18. That killed the community clubs. That really, that just took care of, it was over. And, you know, uh, bands were playing in pubs and I, I just said, you know, I'm not, I'm not playing pubs. There's no way, six nights a week, uh, you know, you're playing to nobody the first three nights. Uh, and I just, I just didn't find that appealing. But Walrus was, we had some real fortune in the fact that and this is another thing, too, that uh, if somebody's out there, uh, we played the Festival Express, the ill-fated Festival Express that went across Canada. And we we opened in uh, at the c and &E in Toronto. And it was, there was 18,000 people uh, at the c and &E. And uh, we, we opened on the bill was like Delaney and Bonnie and the Grateful Dead and Janice mm -hmm. Jones and all these people and so they flew us out there and they flew us back to Winnipeg and we opened in Winnipeg as well but <laughs> um I thought it, it it became kind of political when I would there was the the MC that was there was like Woodstock so they got they got it you know in English you know all right here's a band from Winnipeg and I want them to feel welcome so welcome the walrus you know <laughs> Wow, so I'm walking up to the mic and a guy stands up. It's almost like that Ferris, uh, Forrest Gump scene, you know, in Washington there where, you know, Forrest and it's just, you know, one, his girl running up. Well, this guy stands up in a sea of people. They're all seated on, on, on the grounds. And he stands up, he goes, if you care about those people outside locked out, uh, because the, 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 the this uh, this is a ripoff. Tickets were twelve fifty. Twelve fifty for the entire day. You won't sing a note. And I went, oh, man, I'm just the meat here. Come on, I'm just you know, uh, I, I'm sorry. I said, I'll tell you what, we'll we'll do something for the people out there. Give me remember Country Joe and the Fish. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 So we did that. Yeah. <laughs> And everybody, yeah, yeah, they were they were just absolutely happy to do that. I said, okay, you get happy now, yeah, yeah. So we played. Sets over. Timothy Eaton was one of the sponsors of the Festival Express, and these protests, you know, were hap They started happening right across. This is probably why it disbanded, I believe, in Calgary. 
So Timothy, my manager at the time, <laughs> if you do that in Winnipeg, there won't be a Winnipeg. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> As it was just for the, you know, calm the, the protesters down. And he said, well, it seemed to do that, but, you, you know, don't do it in Winnipeg. I said, yeah, I promise. So that was an experience. And um, we opened in Winnipeg uh, as well. And it, it went it went uh, very well. Uh, the, but the protesters kept this up and, and they had a, they did a, a documentary, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, the Festival Express train. They did a documentary, and we 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 were we were looking for the lost footage because we, if somebody had the footage, we would have been the opening act. But they couldn't find a lot of the footage, so they actually put feelers out if anybody has more footage. But they oh. did the documentary, and it was right. it was really interesting and also hilarious. I mean. The band, uh, <laughs> the band, you know, on this trip, we discovered alcohol. So <laughs> oh, yeah. we this liquor place, and we discovered Canadian Club, and they were just hammered. You know, those guys are going to sing along. And Janice Joplin, who was a known drinker, she was the only sober one in, in the city. <laughs> was she really? <laughs> very, very close. <laughs> you know, I wish I wish we could have been on the train, but they just flew us uh, right. to Toronto and back to Winnipeg. But it was uh, it was really really a terrific experience. And and then Walrus after that, you know, the community clubs dried up, so the band kind of went. Everybody went their own way, and uh, you know, I was lucky to get a recording contract when one yeah. door. Uh, you know, close okay. another one closes, the another one opens. That's right. Well, that's what talk about how 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 you came to sign with Polydor. Um, there was uh, I got a, a break uh, when I was uh, nineteen. When I was nineteen years old, uh, there was a, a, a fellow by the name of Bob Burns. We called him Canada's oldest teenager, and he was doing dance like a, an American dance dance version uh, Bob and the Hits and then on Saturday he would do Teen Dance Party. Well he gave me a start in television because he created a show called Young As You Are and the host that he had doing uh, didn't work out and on November 2nd of 1969 uh, I debuted as the host of this show and he gave me that based on you know, my experience as lead singer for the Mongrels. Yep. So at 19, I had, I was the host of my own television show and that featured all these groups. Uh, the first guests that I had were the 49th Parallel. And then there was yeah, Witness, Robbie Lane of the Disciples, uh, you know, was on one of the shows. It was, it, it really was a great show. It was local. And it was on, uh, every Saturday at five o'clock. So from young as you are, uh, you know, when that ended, I think we had a, a two year run. And when that ended, uh, in that time, Bob had talked to me about, you know, recording some of the songs I had written. And I said, yeah, I'd, I'd love to go. So we went down again to, you know, we, we went to Sound 80. Uh, with Tommy John, uh, which we did earlier with the Mongrels. And uh, we recorded a song called, well, we did, again, four songs there. And we did a song called Tomorrow, Tomorrow. And Tomorrow, Tomorrow actually became the wedding song years later in 1987. It's just, I plagiarized my own song. <laughs> right. That's, a, I mean, yeah. Tomorrow was... Uh, yeah. On this road, road to nowhere. Don't know where I'm going. Right. right. Oh, I want to get once we get to that in the timeline. I want you to go into that uh, the background yeah. on that and how it morphed into that. Yeah, uh, sure. you, you talk talk more about that. But talk about um, you. Um, let me ask you this: uh, being in front, you know, like emceeing these shows, hosting, being in front of people that that came pretty naturally to you. Uh, pretty much, uh, you know. Um, 
I, when I go back to the first time I had to do something in front of, of, uh, of, of a crowd or a classroom, I go back to, I was the first one of the boys to stand up and sing a verse of Little Drummer Boy. Oh, okay. no, none of the guys would do it. And, and uh, all, the, all the girls would be, you know, like, oh, come on, boys, you know, somebody's got to do this. So I stood up and, oh, drummer boy, and you can have my daughter, drummer boy. And, and, and the chicks dug it. <laughs> yeah, they loved that. <laughs> so it's, that's so good, you know, and I thought, hey, this is a good reaction. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I think yeah. that was, you know, I just, couldn't see why the guys were so shy of it. So that would have been my first experience. And it was, thank God, a real nice experience to get that reaction. So it didn't seem, you know, so out of place, uh, you know, to become the, the front man uh, okay. for the Mongols. Uh, when that happened, it was very natural. Very you know? natural. And then getting young as you are, based on what I was doing as a front man, was... You know, it was not, well, yeah, I, I, got, I can still remember my the footsteps out going, hi, I'm Joey, and I'll be your host, you know. I still remember the fear, but yeah. as soon as I got into the show, it was, it was terrific, you know. Right. I experienced right. it years later. But. <laughs> well, you know, I can do this, you know, talking one-on-one, -on -one, um, yeah. but standing up in front of a crowd, you know, giving a speech or oration or something, oh, uh, Definitely afraid of that kind of stuff. Well, it is one of the biggest fears. It is. Yeah, it is. It's, it's, it's public probably, speaking. The biggest yeah. yet in the top five, you know. Right, right. So just imagine everyone in their underwear, right? That's what they tell you to do. So <laughs> I'm, I'm wearing underwear right now. <laughs> right. Well, fast forward. That's why you're so forward. comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, fast forward to uh, your debut album. Uh, you recorded it at Stack Studios in Memphis. Yeah, that again, there were some interesting scenarios there. We were, uh, a little known fact is, okay, I, I was a solo artist by then because I got, I, I signed. So I put together uh, the band, uh, which was, uh, or the let's say the studio musicians, Dick Porter, Lucy, Dick Hedlund, uh, Ron Risco, Bobby Sabellico, who actually, uh, toured with the Guess Who. So they were all, you know, on my session on the um, North Country Funk album. And we were, we were listed as the first all white group to record at Staxville Studios. We didn't know that, you know, we were the first all white group uh, to, to record there. You know, my, let's say my, uh, you know, my little ensemble. And uh, so we were, wow, we didn't, you know, we had no idea, but it was a great, it was a great studio. It was, uh, you know, the history of that, right. you know, Stacks World. Uh, Hayes pulls up, yeah. you know, in his Lincoln, you know, with the, the big, uh, you know, Texas steer horns. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Uh, <laughs> With his fur lame, you know, it's 105 up there. You got to be sweating there, Isaac. It's 105 and you're in a stall. Anyway, <laughs> I'm for you. Um, so he gets out of the uh, the uh, car, the Lincoln, and it's fur lame on the seats and two the most gorgeous women you've ever seen get out with them. I think they were his hairdressers. <laughs> and he was very nice, you know, way, way over, you know, talking in a low voice, you know. And uh, we met uh, people like him. We met uh, Rufus Thomas, Walking the Dog, oh, which was coincidentally years earlier was the Mongrels, you know, theme song, Walking the Dog. And there's the guy, Rufus Thomas, um, Tony Joe White, people like that. It was it was uh, just a wonderful experience. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, I a uh, few years ago went to the uh, Country Music Hall of Fame in the museum, you know, down there and and uh just seeing all the relics that they had, you know, uh and then uh, whose car was it that they had they had actually had his car and it was just all decked out. And and it had the the Longhorn, you know, oh, on, yeah. on, on the hood. So so reminded me of that. And uh, the nudie suits, remember the nudie suits? 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember Graham, Graham Parsons. Graham Parsons. I lived. Uh, I lived near a neighbor who, him and his uh, cronies, his couple of cronies, they went and they stole a whole bunch of <laughs> new suits and they were selling them on his back. <laughs> I didn't buy. I, I didn't buy. No. Back to this. I, yeah, I was going to ask you about recording there. Did you uh, channel any of the spirits of musicians past? Did you, did no, uh, yeah. they called it, well, actually, they, uh, and it could have been Steve Cropper from Booker T. He, he became a good friend. Uh, and I think it was Steve Cropper that said, you know, North Country funk. And he was the one that actually told Polydor, release Jody. That's a hot biscuit. Um, I remember him saying that in Polydor did release Jody as my first uh, single. Uh, you know, uh, I know there were the other ones tomorrow, tomorrow and everything, but they they didn't get by the Maple Leaf system. You know, yet they voted. Yeah. yeah and, you know, we didn't quite make it. Eh. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, Jody became the uh, top three in Canada. And it, it, to me, it was uh, influenced by Creedence Clearwater, John Fogarty. It's always there. You go, yeah. There you go. Took the words right out of my mouth. That's where. That's where I was going to go with that. <laughs> yeah, uh, but yeah. You know, when I first heard that, uh, yeah, I, uh, I thought it was Creedence Clearwater when I first heard that. Yeah. Interesting thing about the uh, the business because when they take you around, I did uh, you know a couple of cross country tours. Yeah. And I won't mention any names or anything, but. There was a powerful station, let's say they, they really wanted this station to play the song and they, they wouldn't play it. And they were very, very influential. So we had a meeting. We had a meeting with the general manager who was sitting in for the music director, who was kind of a bit of a tyrant. It just happened chance that he was sitting in for her that week. So we went in, myself and John Turner, uh, my good friend at Polydor Records, we <laughs> were sitting there and we're sort of, you know, well, why won't you, you know, why won't you play Jody? What's, you know, what's the holdup kind of thing? And he said, well, I just heard a talk like this. I said, you know, well, that uh, kind of sounds like something Glenn Campbell would do. <laughs> <laughs> Glenn Campbell's so huge. What are you talking about? Like, I said, well, I, I kind of think it sounds like, you know, Prince Clearwater. I mean, that's that's why yeah. that's yeah. part of the industry that you have to put up with, and they right. did not play it, so it didn't it didn't get into the state. It's it's weird, yeah, interesting what certain people hear, you know, when they hear a song, you know, or don't and what they compare it to. Yeah, it's just you know somebody maybe that's a little tone deaf, maybe I don't know. <laughs> it's like one of those little monkeys that you know. What? <laughs> <laughs> Right, <laughs> right. Yeah, how did you get this job? Okay. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. And ironically, where I was going with that is that same general manager that, you know, was sitting in for the music director at that time became a general manager at the radio station I was working at years later. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Remember me? <laughs> Remember me. Oh, yeah. man. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Yeah, are you uh, are you glad the DJs flipped over? Uh, Don't let your pride get you, girl, and played the B side. Well, it, it, really, it was bombing. Uh, you know, we did not. I didn't want them to release that. And yeah. the people that broke it were the Maritimes. The Maritimes, and and this is another kind of uh, enigmatic sort of situation, if that's the right term. Um, they said that the radio stations in the Maritime said, we're not playing Don't Let Your Pride. We're playing the five minute version of Down by the River. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Neil Young covered it, did. And that forced Polydor to go in and edit the song because the, the rest yeah. of the rules, you couldn't, you know, the song couldn't be over three, whatever, three yeah. minutes 30 or whatever it was. So Polydor rushed it in and edited the 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 song and won my first Juno with that song. So yeah. it's yeah, it's been very, very special. And I credit the Maritimes and and the interesting thing there is that I was probably the first Canadian artist to get a five minute airplay. You know? Oh, oh yeah. Because the Maritimes is no, we're gonna play the album right off the album. Even the AM 
the stations. The AM station did that. We would do that too. Yeah. So they they had no choice but you know but to rush for at least it edited and it was it just worked magic. Yeah. Yeah, you know that's interesting because uh, a lot of bands uh, singles that they put out, I prefer the B side. You know, and I've talked about this, you know, several interviews. Um, a lot of times, that's the track that the band prefers. You know, the A side, the the uh, label, the management, you know, is kind of pushing that one. But a lot of times, uh, that's why I prefer and listen to the B sides, and there, there's a lot of good tracks there. Yeah, wow. over. Well, it's like what you said earlier, too. It depends on, you know, who's listening, how they're listening, yeah. what, you know, they get out of the song. So yeah. you never know. And you leave yourself open for that, you know. Uh, right. A fluke is a fluke. <laughs> a fluke hit is a fluke. <laughs> no, thank you. Right. Thank you. Exactly. Glad that it's happened. <laughs> Throughout history, you know, there's a lot of a lot of uh, songs that became hits by flipping them over. So it's it's yeah. good that the, that they have, have done that, tried the B-side. Well, that must have been a pretty uh, proud moment for you winning the Juno Award in 1972. Yeah, it was. Uh, they uh, at the the Juno dinner. Uh, it was it, you know it was held in in a, in a great big uh, banquet hall, of course. And my, one of my friends from RPM uh, magazine, Walt Grealis. Uh, there was Walt Grillis and Stan Cleese, but Walt Grillis, it was the one that, you know, I was closer to. Uh, and he was he was just a wonderful man and very fair, very fair. And it had articles, you know, uh, done on me for, you know, quite a few RPMs. And I was grateful to him for that. But I remember that we were sitting uh, talking after. And he was saying, you know, this is great, uh, you know, uh, that congratulations. And I said, you know, Walt, you should, you should a actually have this, tele you know, televised. And he looked at me and said, you you'd think anybody would watch this? <laughs> yes, I do now, you know, <laughs> right. a couple of years later, all of a sudden. And yeah. it morphed into, you know, a big, a big day every year in Canadian music history. But yeah, it, it it started oh, way back when, and you know I, I I couldn't believe he said I said yes I think they would. <laughs> yeah we need to air this <laughs> okay, <I'm> the one <laughs> so you can rehash you know, redo <laughs> right yes yes definitely yes well your uh, your second album tell the people was also recorded well you mentioned Steve Cropper earlier it was recorded at his studio yeah uh, right in also in Memphis. Yeah, uh, how was the uh, how how was how did the recording sessions go go on this one? Uh, it, it, I I think when I when I listen to it, I, I'm critical of both albums, different versions. I think North Country Punk got a little misdirected in the fact that a lot of the some of the songs did not come out the way I actually had written them. Okay. It, it kind of got into too much of the too much funk, really. Um, and I, I was kind of disappointed in some of the, uh, you know, in, in some of both of the albums and tell the people, uh, there are a couple of really good solid songs on there, uh, for the last time is almost like try a little tenderness. Yeah. Yeah. And builds and the solo was done by Paul Cannon. Uh, right. and he just nailed it. He just did a wonderful solo on there. So I like those songs. Then there's a, uh, there, there's a song called I Don't Believe My Mind Can Stand Much More, which yes. I listen to and I go, it's not finished. It's just not oh, finished. Oh, really, really? Yeah. I like that. I like that track. I really yeah, like it, that. It, yeah, And, it, it, you know, I mean, a lot of the songs, like even Jody and I Don't Believe My Mind Can Stand Much More is... Uh -huh means a lot today in today's world. Jody yeah. is a good name. It's not about a guy or girl. Jody's right. a good name for people who are free. Jody stands for freedom, whatever free. Jody means. And that's, my gosh, look where we are in today's world. I think that if that song is covered or released, the rock version, there's two versions of it. The, the original and then the video that you can get on YouTube. The YouTube one is the Harder Edge Credence that's the yeah. one I like. 
That's the one I like. Uh, you, you know, like that. It was released today. It means just as much as it did then. Because Jody was a term, too, that I coined, instead of a hippie, you're a Jody. You want to live in peace, harmony, freedom, you know. Right. So ride, ride, ride on down the highway. Freedom's in the air, you know. Right. So um, it, it, they mean as much today. I don't believe my mind can stand much more. It, it, it's all right there. Running yeah. through my mind and thinking of the time the world was alive and well. Right. And how we brought, and brought, you know, when people cared and people dreamed the right. impossible, but brought the world to this, you know. Right. Well, you know, like you said back there, the end of the 60s, early 70s, rebellion was in the air. And I think it's it's in the air again. I think it is. It is. Yeah. But for a, in a, for a good way. Like, yeah, right. That's, right. That's right. Nonsense. And let's, a, a friend of mine, uh, Pat Riordan, uh, who, who passed away was just a great man. Uh, he said, you know, why can't we all just line up at the starting line? You know, they shoot a gun in the air and everybody goes. And the best, you know, the fastest, the best, whatever, um, you know, the most qualified get the positions, get, get to do all the, you know, the important things and doing it properly. You know, patronage appointments, patronage appointments, it, it, it just doesn't work. You know, nepotism, stuff like right. that. And you can yeah. see it for years, you know, just kind of degenerating, let's say. Right. Um, and, and the yeah. whole, we could get, we could have a whole, a whole interview on this, but, yeah. but, but, but the uh, whole, it, it, I'm just, just, I, yeah, yeah, I'm just tired of all the apologizing. Yeah. So what does that right. do? You, think, you know, right. That, Right. I, I know now, and just a quick comment too, comedians, sure. comedians are, you know, there's a backlash from comedians. They don't yes. like what's going on. You know, yes. I tell you, you know, we get no respect. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that's, that's, that's sometime the, the, the first point of uh, reference to is the comedians, you know, listening to them, you know, and, and then you'll get the, you'll get the general uh, feel of, of society, what's going on. Yeah. Just like you said, those comedians. That's well, why you have a yeah, choice. There's a button yeah. on the TV. There is a doorway in any, yeah, you know, hallway. Don't like it? See you. Right. <laughs> bye bye. Army, anybody. Don Rickles. If you, can you imagine Don Rickles trying to launch his uh, career? Now? I mean, no, today, before, today and, no. and no, at the no. end of his comedy routine, he said, "Look, I come out here and I call somebody a dummy on a hockey puck." And, right. Right. You know, uh, I make fun of what we are, what we've made ourselves. But at the right. end of, you know, at the end of the road or the end of the, the river, the stream, we're all rowing in the same direction. It's a beautiful right. speech. And, you know, I, hyper, hyper, hypersensitivity today. I saw a, a post on Facebook. You may have seen it, too. Uh, why we were not so uh, since I forget what it said, why we were not so sensitive back in the day. Uh, no. We could, we could all, you know, George Carlin, uh, <laughs> Richard Price, yeah, I mean, Richard Pryor, Richard, Richard Pryor. Pryor, I said Price, Richard Pryor, uh, the uh, the movie, what was it called, uh, Mel Mel Brooks, oh, yeah, um, Blazing Saddles, yeah, Blazing Saddles, you know, it showed there, you know, and just making fun of yourself, being able to make fun of yourself, yeah, you know, laugh, at, go? Yeah. Yeah. laugh at yourself, yeah, and one of the greatest. Yeah. One of the greatest shows that I uh, watched over the years because they all took a chance and mm -hmm. it taught you not to be a racist was right. all family Archie Bunker. Right. All it, in the family. That, that was what that 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 showed don't be an Archie Bunker. But it you showed Archie. Yeah. Yeah. That was who it, it showed great Archie. Way of teaching not to be a racist. Great right. way. Because uh, right. uh, Carol right. Carter took all that on his shoulders. You Carol think? Carter. Wow. And it was great way of Norman Lear, Carol O'Connor. And that was a great way of and, saying it. And the flip flop, the Jeffersons, yeah. Yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. We yeah. we were all able to watch, all races yeah. able to watch those those things, you know. That's and not be not be offended. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, back to the back to the album. Um you mentioned I don't believe my mind can stand much. I love the uh, backing vocals on that one. I wanted to mention oh, that. Yeah, really, really nice. That was arranged by uh, my uh, my late friend uh, Ron Risco. 
and uh, he was uh, he was terrific at arranging harmonies. So I would he'd tell me the note to sing. I was I'm not a great harmony singer, but with Ron's coaching, yeah, uh, you know it was easy to do. It was easy to do. We did it right there on the spot. I I, I do want to mention. I want to go back just a bit to down by the mm -hmm. river. Uh, mm -hmm. We did Down by the River. Um, I never heard the finished product till a month later. Uh, okay. uh, the interesting thing, there's so many weird things that happened in my career, but all good. Um, we had three hours of recording time left. That was it. And we were short one song on the album. And we had to leave the next day. Uh, and we had three hours left before, and we had to catch a flight back to Winnipeg. And so the night before, we discovered alcohol. Okay. Okay. <laughs> In the hotel, well, what do we do? What, what are we going to do for that 10th song? And uh, so, I, you know, I, I was camping and I went, uh, you know, and I'll lay John, here we are, the Ribby Show. Here's Jose Feliciano singing Neil Young's Down by the River, right? <laughs> so I, then I'd go, down by the river, down by the river. Now come and meet me down by the river. With that, the, the producer, Ron Capone, says, that's a hit. I said, what, you lost your mind? What are you He said, no, can you do that with that rhythm? Said, yeah. Yeah, you know, I could do that. You want me to do, yeah, sure. So we went to the studio we had dick dick headland dick bordalusi ron risco and me the, the four of us and i sang it live you know one take live uh, uh dick headland played the bass uh dick bordalusi did the the, the uh, rim shot you know uh, and and then added to the congas and ron would would play uh, just uh, you know a rhythm and then we did the harmony and if you listen to the song yeah. we so quickly and it, we had to do it efficiently and quickly that's yeah. all that down was that that's all it was was just the four of us laying down that basic track and if yeah. you listen to it you hear yeah. down by the river uh, you know and you hear a little overlap er, I shot my yeah. you know yes uh, yes it was natural. It, okay. it, and that's the difference. That's the difference yeah. in music that's long lasting. It's it was hand, you know, crafted, if you right. will, not technology, you know, perfect. Right. You know, that was all, all those little, you know, warts uh, here. Yes. That's what made uh, songs actually successful when you didn't really polish them up. There was also yes. something about that. So, they they took Ron Capone took that bare track and he had Isaac Hayes uh lead player play Bobby Manuel played on there, Marvell Thomas played keyboards, and they they added the instruments. I didn't hear it till a month later. They said, Well, finish down by the river here. And I, I went, Wow, fantastic. Yes. You know, yes. Uh, Bobby Manuel played that. Da, 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 da. We just nailed it. And, right. Yeah, and that's how Down by the River came to be. So yeah. I never, wow, ladies and gentlemen. Well, yeah, you're, <clears throat> I like your version. Thank you. Because, because you said that, yeah, the, the rhythm was, and you almost don't recognize it is the same song until you get to the chorus. Yeah, and believe it or not, that's a good thing. That's a good one thing. Of the, uh, the crowning glories I had, there was an internet song battle. Neil's yeah. and mine, and mine won. I, I, I just, oh, wow. Just blown away, blown away. Yeah, you know, I mean, how, how great is that? You know, I mean, it's so in tune. And he's never really said what the song is about. He said, I, I dreamt it once. Be on my side, I'll be on your side. Yeah. Uh, and I know it went through a little bit of a uh, uh, controversial. It was pulled off the air for a time. And yeah. I, I talked to one program director and I said, why, why is, well, we got a letter from this group and they said it's violence against women. And I said, so you, you pulled the song off the air. 
And I said, it's just a song. Neil doesn't even know what it is. You know, right. there could be a double entrant for I shot my baby. You know, there could be, there could be. So, no. So how can you do that? You know, why that I, I feel kind of, you know, slighted here that you're pulling that song. He goes, well, no, you know, it, it is a little over the top. So I went, I saw the light on the night that I passed by her window. I felt the night, right? You're still playing that. The night Chicago died. Right. It was right. back on the air. It's a yeah. song. It's a song. Yeah. It doesn't say go out and kill somebody. Um, you mentioned earlier Stampeders. Uh, it's uh, sad that... Um, Ronnie. Ronnie that passed away not too long ago. Exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah. I had breakfast uh, with Ronnie and Kim uh, last year. And yeah. Louis yes. and, I mean, he was he was really not doing well on the tour. You know, right. he was very weak. Yeah, I could yeah. sense that even when I talked to him, I could sense that, you know, yeah. he, he wasn't completely all there. Um, but we went through it. I'm glad to have that. That's my first casualty, you know. Yeah. So in doing these. So hope it'll be a while before there's. Yeah. There's another one, you know. I hope so. Well, I, I wanted to mention um, from the uh, the second album, there were a few singles lifted from it. Uh, Take the blindness. I really like that one. I really like that. Uh, if we're talking what they did chart wise, I think Take Take yeah. the Blindness was uh, top twenty, about yeah. top twenty. Uh, yeah. Bye Bye Love was also released. Yeah, and, and I like your I like your version. I like the, so, yeah. uh, Greetings, yeah. you know. Well, okay. it, we did it this way. This is how he right. would do. It. So we did right. uh, "Love, I Love," uh, "Take the Blindness." I really, really wish they would have released uh, for the last time on the okay. Tony Blue album. Uh, right. That is great, great right. song. Like you say so. The, the people that added it, not just yeah. the fact that I wrote it or anything, but the people, the musicians on there. Uh, some of the Memphis musicians were just awesome. Paul Cannon's solo is just dynamite. Just right. dynamite. And it, the song just takes yes. off, like you know, uh, like the Otis Redding. Uh, yeah, and right. There's shades of that. You're right. You're right. Uh, the title track, "Tell the People," great guitar in that one. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Again, again, great musicians. I was very blessed to have these, you know, some of these people. And I, I know this, Steve Cropper played uh, on "Take the Blindness." In, yeah. in the part where he goes, "So don't blame me for what I am," right? And you hear. Choo, 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 so we have yeah. the album. We got we, we thank Steve Cropper for the chicks, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> right. And then an album track that wasn't a single. The time is right. Uh, yeah. I, I really like it. That's that's a nice track. Very zombieous. Zombie. Yeah. Yes, you know? it is. Yes, it is. Uh, that that's that was the influence. I love the zombies. Colin Blunstone. I had oh, the privilege oh, years later of introducing every one of their shows here. In Winnipeg, oh. you know, and to yeah. meet Argent and Blundstone, wow, you know, that's some that's someone I would really love to talk to. Uh, yeah. I've reached out to I've reached out to him. I haven't heard anything back, but oh, yeah. okay. the zombies in the word for you. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, the zombies, yeah, yeah. Me. one of my top, Joe, <laughs> <laughs> you know, top top bands, yes, of all time. Well, um, the interesting thing too about that. The the zombies, for example, they 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 had hits after they broken up already. Right. They broken up and they're right. sticking hits. Mm. You right. know, I mean the 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 breathy vocals of uh, Colin yeah. Blackstone and the genius of mm. Rob Argent. Well, right, right. Uh, you know, you just right. you try, mm. Time is Right is very much inspired oh. by them. Oh, and just that Baroque sound that they had. You know, real a lot of the songs real summery just it, it takes me back when i first heard that every time this it just makes me think of summertime so much of it well um so in 74 uh what was the story you had to fulfilled your contract with polydor is that kind of kind of yeah, way yeah i was signed to uh columbia for one night and one long, night now <laughs> <laughs> and they gave me a bunch of front money, and they, I said, yeah, we're, we're done with Polydor. And Polydor came back the next day and said, no, you're not. <laughs> the clause we exercised, they put in an 11th-hour clause. Oh. And to me, what do I know about legal stuff? You know? Right. And so they put right. in an 11th-hour clause, and they said, okay. 
uh, uh, Columbia gave me 12,500 12, front money to sign with them. And I said, yeah, we're free and clear from Potter. No, we weren't. Potter comes back and said, all we have to do is give you 3,500 and oh. extend the contract. And so they came in and intercepted and it just went nowhere after that. Okay. You know, it was, there was not another uh, hit. Uh, yeah. And that was it for me. I stopped touring in 1975. I had enough of it. It was, I mean, touring was very tough. Very yeah. tough. <clears throat> and, yeah. You know, when you end up playing the show clubs and you're playing six nights a week. Right. So it, it it was really hard. It you know, it's hard work. It yeah. was hard. Work. And I have you know, heard I've heard that in yeah. doing the well, we played the Red Lion uh in Saskatoon, which was a very big huge club. And we broke uh, uh who was it now? Um, you know, Bobby uh Curtola's record uh for audience, you know, that week. But I lost my voice about the third mm -hmm. night in. We were there for two weeks. And I yeah. remember standing <laughs> up crowd and saying you know i feel i'm cheating i'm so sorry you know whatever and they're going no, no they were very understanding so you know i kind of got through it uh yeah. but I, I, it wasn't a great memory really wasn't you know yeah. uh, for me personally but everybody else you know the crowd was understanding the people that came in and then we played grannies that was uh in toronto that was uh that was that and the prior the friars club in uh toronto am i right Friars and Grannies, I think. Um, and at the Friars Club, uh, or Granny, it was Grannies, you could it was sort of in the basement type of setting, and you could smoke in those days. And I was I've never been a smoker. Yeah. And we, you know, <clears throat> trying to get, and I remember singing Take the Blindness. You know? <laughs> I slid on one note, there was no hiding. <laughs> no hiding. <laughs> So, uh, you know, when you came up, you know, on things, uh, situations like that, you just soldiered on. You had, there's nowhere to go. You just right. did the best you could, and that was it. Right, <clears throat> right. Well, speaking of your voice, uh, it still sounds good today. Um, any Anything that you do, you, you drink honey or anything that you do to take care of your voice? I uh, found a vocal teacher in 1995. Mm -hmm. Her name was Alicia Seaborn, and she escaped a situation in Poland. And the reason she did mm -hmm. is because she had such a wonderful talent, a beautiful voice, that she, they had her entertaining the troops. And her husband, Richard, got her out of her, you know, got her out of uh, Poland at, the, at that terrible time. And she was only, she lived only a block away and I didn't know that till a friend of mine said, listen, I'll be in your area. Um, I'm having, uh, I'm doing a vocal lesson with my teacher. I went, who, what teacher? She goes, Alicia, and she's wonderful. And I went, oh, uh, she teaches vocal, yeah. So I decided to sign up and learn more about the voice. And what Alicia taught me in 1995 was bel canto, bel canto singing which is powerful, it's Pavarotti, Bocelli. Uh, yes. that, that rejuvenated my voice. I have a bigger range now than I did when I was 20. And that's all thanks to Alicia. She was just, you know, she talked like this, you know, <laughs> take care of instrument, instrument. You take, you take it everywhere with you, you guard it. One day I showed up and it, it was winter, no scarf. Oh, oh. No start. What? 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 Get in. <laughs> Such a, we thought she'd go on forever. Mm -hmm. uh, she was just a beautiful, beautiful soul. So she taught me bel canto. And uh, so my regiment, my practice regiment to this day is uh, about an hour of singing Conte Partiro, uh, O Solo Mio. Uh, Il Mare del Como, you know, De La Sera, stuff like that, Bocelli Pavarotti. That's, yeah, yeah. Every, every, <laughs> you know, every odd day, I don't go more than a day without doing an hour at least of that. And then I do, you know, the rock and roll stuff as well, okay. which, which is <clears throat> much easier when you do 
boot camp. <laughs> boot camp. Okay. Right. Yeah, man, I'll go first. This. <laughs> right, right. Well, how long after uh, <clears throat> that you had uh, gotten out of the <clears throat> the Polydor uh, contract had you started uh, writing jingles for radio ads? Well, when I quit touring in 1975, mm -hmm. uh, I sat around for a year, did nothing, lived off, you know, royalties, which were really good in those days, you know, because I was still collecting for Jody and, you know, all that kind of stuff uh, and the albums. And uh, then, you know, it started drying up and I went, OK, I got to do something. So I actually uh, got a job selling clothes at Tip Top Taylor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in, here in Winnipeg and that was an interesting profession and a few uh, disparaging stories about that but I won't go into that <laughs> that's all right I'm a Ted Farr walker Ted Farr was a radio guy anyway okay. so what are you doing uh, here I went I often think about that myself <laughs> right. I was for only about six months okay right? And I, it, it was okay, but, you know, it was something to do, but it, you know, I just wasn't feeling that at the end of the day, I did anything. And uh, so Ted Farr said, would you consider taking a job? KY58 was uh, my friend, his name was Woody, and I can't remember his last name, but he said, my friend Woody is putting together a creative department at KY58 and it's writing commercials. Do you think you'd like some to do something like that? And I went, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't mind doing that. I mean, it's, it's like 30 or 60 second songs. So yeah. sure, I, I'd give it a try. So I went down there, they hired me. And lo and behold, I won over the two years that I was in creative writing, I won 14 Canadian awards and one international at the radio festival in New York where we bested John Cleese of Monty Python. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it was, it was great. And you, because again, you mentioned this early, like, when you're not inhibited, when you're not, yeah. when there's no borders put on you, you do your best work, you, you know? Right. And that, those were the days too, where, you know, it was, that's, <clears throat> that's the way I wrote it and that's the way I like it. <laughs> and uh, the, 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 uh, the award that I won, the one that bested John Cleese, was so simple. There was one sound effect uh -huh. That's in the entire song, uh, and commercial, and yeah. it was for a car restoration place, right? Uh -huh. you, you know, if your car has been in an accident, right? And it was Pan Am Motors Body Shop. That that was yeah. the, the ad. So all you hear is door slam. Guy goes, "Hi, welcome to Pan Am Motors." Can I help you? Yeah, I, I um, yeah, I, I, I understand you do some really good restoration work here. Well, we do our best, sir. Yeah, I, um, I, brought, I, I, I brought my car in. Uh, thank goodness. I and and I went like this, and you could, you could even, you know, see it. Listen, to me, I went I had a little bit of an accident, uh, accidentally, but we left it in. I said, yeah. I, my car, I had a little bit of an accident. Uh, I, 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 I guess the guy in the steamroller didn't see me. What? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, it's okay. I had my lights on. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it, the car needs some repair. Um, so <laughs> you handle it. He goes, Well, yeah, you know, certainly we'll do your best. Where's, where's the car now? And I went, uh, In my wallet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we broke up. Me and a partner on the air, Ford Gardner, he was my technical engineer. Yeah. yeah, in my wallet. And we both, <laughs> we, were both there. we left that in. Uh -huh. That was the commercial. One sound effect and busting up and it yeah. was in New York. So simplicity does sell. <laughs> it, oh. it does. It does sell. <laughs> in, 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 my, in my wallet. Yeah. <laughs> right. Johnny Carson. And yeah. <laughs> right. I could hear that. <laughs> right. We well, also worked as a DJ also. Yeah. Uh, uh, when I was in the creative department, uh, there was a fellow here that uh, was starting to dominate uh, the mornings. He was on KY58. His name is Don Percy. 
and uh, he he was just gaining gaining ratings. And the sister station thought, oh, this is too close to comfort. So they actually, we had a tyrant come in at KY58, and he just destroyed the station, was firing this guy. It was getting rid of this. He fired Don's girlfriend. She was on at midnight, right? And so he fired her, and that was that that really really irritated Don because this guy was. You know, I've got nothing good to say about him. And um, so Don, the sister, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, there was a station that wanted him kind of out of the market. So they told Edmonton, an Edmonton station, this guy might be available and he's doing some good things here. So Don went to Edmonton and quit. So then Brian, Brian Wood was... Um, I always get him as funny as his last name. And uh, so the the ironic thing here, remember I told you earlier, the, the music director that wouldn't play, who's sitting in, came to me and said, could you go in and sit with Brian and uh, you kind of, you know, could you loosen him up? Could you add some humor? And I said, well, I've never been on, you know, never been on radio on the air before, but he said, look, your old job, if it doesn't work, if you don't like it, you got your old job back. Eh, wrong. <laughs> I was still there and I never got my old job back, which I would have, I would have gone back in the creative department. I loved it. So anyway, Don exits. I go on the air with Brian Wood. Brian Wood has his, uh, he has certain issues. He wanted to pretty much go home and his home was in Hamilton. Okay. So he left and Ford Gardner and I, uh, became the morning show. Uh, so it was like uh, Joey and Uncle Forty in the morning. And ah. we started to do very well. We we created the uh, 745 main event, which was a comedy bit every day. Yeah. Uh, on Monday, it was uh, uh, the, the, a mundane show. The, the, the Adventures of Jack and Enid Spruce. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's called The Edge of Boredom. The edge of boredom. <laughs> Today we find out about their new pet. You know, I, I would do Enid's, Enid Spruce's voice. You know, well, what are we going to do today, Jack? I don't know. And for I don't know, Enid Spruce. I think maybe we better train the puppy. You know, <laughs> it was just <laughs> malarkey, just garbage, mundane. And we were talking about how he he said. Um, uh, we we trained the uh, the dog to go on uh, you know we're trying to teach him to go on on paper or whatever it was yeah. and that tied into he said he, he said oh uh, old uh, Lars trained the dog to play dead on his head because Lars was bald and the dog made a lovely toupee. And he said, a lot of that work out, and he said, "Not great during the paper training stage." <laughs> oh, the <laughs> training! <laughs> and then Tuesday was strange but true. You know, uh, we had all these strange, but true. and even stranger than that, at the end of all these strange stories, it was like a Rod Serling uh, oh. thing. So at the end of the thing, uh, Ford would go, and even stranger than that is the morning when Joey's eggs will have him for breakfast, right? <laughs> Who came uh, first? Wednesday was, was the most popular one. Wednesday, oh. we had Wild Animal Domain. Remember Merlin, Marlon Perkins? Yes, yes, I did. Wild, whatever yep. it was. We had Wild Animal Domain and with uh -huh. Merlinville Parkins. That was right. our case. <laughs> That was yeah. your I'm Merleyville Parkins, and today my partner Jim Oliver and I will, you know, wrestle the. We're going to wrestle the giant anaconda snake. Are you all going? That if Jim doesn't do this, I will show the videos of the snakes Jim wrestled with at the Christmas party. <laughs> okay, let's go. Here we go. So that was that was a very popular, very popular skit Thursday. Uh, Thursday, we saluted uh, various occupations with the instant cassette recording service. And yeah. first, we, we would go, yes. but, um, 
we would go to the air uh, the airport and get a pilot to say hi. This is Captain Merv Medill, and we're saluting all the pilots out there. And I would take Ford was brilliant at removing vocals even yeah. before karaoke came. He vocal out on the stereos because he put them on one side. And then we do planes. Well, I just love to fly on the planes, right? So we yeah. select different occupations every Thursday. And then Friday, that was that was so much fun, where we did the adventures of Lance Fontaine detective <laughs> and his, his uh, cohort, uh, Baron von Schieferdar. Yes, Lance, he would talk like this. And Ford did that brilliantly. And what we did was we'd get a script of the adventures of Lance Fontaine to somebody that wanted to be in as the villain. So we put the script to them and they'd be on the phone on Friday as the villain. And I mean, they, they maybe have a night to look over like, oh my God, this, you know, and they would just, they they just gravitate to be a villain on, on, <laughs> live, on live radio. Yeah, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. Those it guys. sounds, it sounds like it. And that was before like the red green show. Yeah. You know, but it but but similar territory, you guys, you guys, you know, I, I think, too, that, you know, in doing these parodies, uh, people would say you you did parodies even before. Um, oh, gosh, his name just flew out of my head. Um, uh, like a like a like a sturgeon. Uh, what's his name? You know, uh, <laughs> he's the king of parodies. He said you probably think it was before he did, and his name just it's, it's just, I'm so embarrassed. Hey? His yeah, name I'm is trying to think. I'm trying to think. Oh yeah, Weird Al. Weird Al. Okay, Weird Al, of course, of course, Weird Al. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was quite a compliment. Yeah. Quite a compliment. yeah. And then over here in uh, America, we had the Fireside Theater. You know, that was it was doing that kind of stuff for a, for oh, a while. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. oh fab, yeah. yeah. Funny stuff. Well, that's interesting. Did you, had you always uh, had a good sense of humor? You know, always. Uh, oh yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, I remember uh, being in um, at Earl Gray Junior High, and I would do uh, uh, John F. Kennedy. People they they'd have me do it. as far as New Frontiers, and I would do that. That's I was good. Well, yeah. Fifteen years old. Right. And yeah, and listen when that. Horrible assassination took place. I cried. I, you yeah. know, I was so affected by it. But he was such a charismatic, uh, easy person to imitate. And, and the, the classmates would say, "Do, do the president, do the president," you know. And then the other one was uh, Diefenbaker, John Diefenbaker. Just put Lamond. He could never <laughs> pronounce. Rich Little did a fabulous. Script. Rich Little. I was uh, just thinking, yeah. His name's Et Monsieur. My ladies and my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I'd love to pick up. And I, I, actually, some of the impressions, uh, I yeah. would learn from other impressions. Von Meter did the impression of John F. Kennedy, and I learned to do listening to jo uh, Von Meter. Uh -huh. Do he even look like Kennedy? Wow. So, well, you well, you. I'm sure you can do Jimmy Stewart then. Uh, 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 Jimmy Stewart done uh, uh, Gloria. It's, it comes walking down my street there and uh, <laughs> opens the gate and comes up to my place. Uh, there's nothing going on. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's the one that's been oh, done. All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Life. That's good. I just thought I just that just came to me. Well, uh, how long uh, or how did you become a host of the Skittle Bits, the TV show? Uh, that I was uh, I, my morning show when I left uh, KY58. I went to uh, CHMM FM, Jermon, uh, Jermon, CHMM, <laughs> and uh, I was there for about uh, five years, and. It just got morning radio. Whew. I mean, you, you just have to show up. You know, the wind's whistling through your socks. And, you know, in Winnipeg, January, February is not a picnic, you know. Yeah. And uh, I, I, after a while, it started to really get to me. And then there were changes in the station I didn't really kind of agree with. And all of a sudden, uh, a fellow by the name of Rod Webb called me up and said, 
we we have to replace our uh, Uncle Bob and Archie. Archie and his friends, Uncle Bob. And he was a dear man. He did that for years, 20 years. If he would have left, he would have probably been a huge star. He was offered uh, to go to Toronto uh, because he was that good. He was a ventriloquist. And mm -hmm. so he, he was at the end of his career. And they said, we want to create a new kind of kids show. And I thought, well, I'll give it a go. I'll, uh, we'll we'll put some stuff together. And if you like it, yeah, okay. So I thought of the name Skittle Bits, and that's a play on words, it's kids bits. So I said it's Skittle Bits, S-K-I-D-D-L-E, yeah. -D -D -E, and then bits. And they liked what I came up with. Uh, so Uncle Bob went, you, you retired. And Skittle Bits started in 1987. We had a good run till 93. And it's, uh, every day, we, and then they added a Saturday show. And so I, I really didn't have a staff. I just, you know, had camera people that I requested to go and do bits with. And John Kukuro was uh, my uh, producer, and he certainly added a lot to the show as well. So it, it, it was fun. It was a second childhood with pain. <laughs> right. I mean, then we took with Brian and I'm my friend now uh, and in Walrus, Brian and I put a little show together with a magician by the name of Steve Tamara and we would tour Manitoba uh, based on the Skittle Show and we went all over Manitoba and it was a, it was a fun show. It was the kids were so good and you, we'd have them singing and, you know, Get, get some of them on stage and it, it really was because we, we we didn't you know hi little jimmy you know like we we talked them like they were little adults and you know it would it was really a very heartwarming time you know it was good for me it was uh and you, you meet some kids that you know the parents request you know he's our little one is dying and they really like so you you go out there and it just you, you know, you get out of the house, after, excuse me, you, you leave the house and you just break into tears that, you know, this meant so much to this little one. And then you realize that's why you do the things that you do. And that's right. yeah, that's why you, and that ran for, um, you know, from 87 to 93. And then they wanted to do a more adult show. Yeah. And awesome. So we did High Noon. High Noon. H I. <laughs> that became very successful. Yeah, uh, I did that only for a year, and I knew that because they changed the rules of, well, if you're doing a newscast, that counts as local. <laughs> yeah, we were. We knew our days were numbered for one year. Jan Arden saying, "I would die for you" before it was a hit, because yeah. she was yeah. the A and R guy was saying, "We can't really line up interviews for this new artist. Would you have her on?" I said, "Sure." So she uh -huh. came. My noon show and saying I still have that performance. Uh, oh, do you? They, yeah, yeah. I, I have a garage full of uh, three quarters. Three quarters is not the best, you know. Yeah. Transfer quality, quality. Yeah. Yeah, the quality. So if I do a transfer, it's got to be one transfer to you know direct uh, whatever I put it to DVD or whatever. Yeah. And uh, in that show, we also had an interview with Garth Brooks. Uh, we we're lucky. We got really lucky. Somebody to this day, I don't know who did this. Somebody uh, to this day gave a copy to TNN. Okay. That one. They had a video show right across Canada. And I got a phone call two weeks watching the last two weeks of the recorded schedule, but, or uh, high noon shows. I'm mm -hmm. watching the last one. Okay, it's over in two weeks. We recorded the shows. And so I get a, a phone call and Hi, is this uh, Joey Gregorash? I said, it's Gregorash. Who's this? <laughs> well, my name is Ann Boatman. I'm from TNN. I said, yeah, who is this? <laughs> well, oh, wait a minute. Here comes Gar. Oh, wait, just a minute. Oh, I like this part. I said, no, really, who is this? She said, well, I'm from TNN. I'm Ann Boatman. And she was in the programming division. And she says, we really like what you're doing on yeah. this new show. Would you be interested in coming down here? And here's the here's the catchphrase. We are trying to cement our relations with our Canadian talent, with our Canadian producers and everything like that. 
And I went, well, yeah, I, I'd love to, to come down there. And she said, uh, what does this episode cost? And it was the best of skill list. She said, what does one of these episodes cost about 37,000? I went, it doesn't cost that in an entire year. <laughs> I, just, I'm, you know, I just used their equipment. And yeah. so she said, I'm going to give this to Tom, whoever, I can't remember his last name, and he's our program director, and he'll be getting in touch with you. Yeah. I, I'm just flying. And what I established with Anne was uh, a, a great rapport and the fact that I'd phone her up as Bill Clinton. I said, yeah. I, you know, that's Bill Glenn calling in. <laughs> My God, you know, I got to get down. What are you wearing right now? <laughs> She's laughing. <laughs> She's going, no, no, it's, it's, really, it's really me. And Hillary, put that down. <laughs> don't, don't do that. You know. um, so uh, I didn't realize at the time when she said, we're trying to cement ties and yeah. further our ties with you. Because in January coming up of that year, coming our Canadian country video network on, oh, no, no. I phone and say, hey, Ann, uh, it's Joey. I just saw this commercial. Yeah, please call me back. It's a promo for, you know, I hope this doesn't affect, you know, CNN in any way. But please call me back. Well, she didn't. Yeah, and here comes the oh Canadian, and I'm going. We we're, we're not that super rich right now in Canadian country. What is it? You know what? Anne Marie Gordon Lightfoot or uh, <laughs> uh, Anne, was it maybe Neil Young? You know, yeah. uh, we weren't really super rich or, or deep into country, and she didn't call me back. And then January sixth, she finally did, and she said, Joey, I, I'm really sorry to tell you, but everything is frozen it's any offers are off the table our ceo is you know is just super pissed uh because yeah. they 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 kind of threw us off the air who are these people i said you know i i, I don't know what it's going to take if i can rally some of the artists you know against this and there was you know michelle wright uh Pat, patricia conroy uh lisa brokaw they they paid a price too. You know, I remember Patricia Conroy saying, Yeah, we're shopping for independent deals. Yeah. Uh, it affected Canadian artists because the guy said, Well, maybe we don't have to play Canadian country artists. Yeah. And it was off the table. I was heartbroken. And I said, Can I come down there, you know, visit? She said, You can, but I don't know if anything's going to happen. So I went down there in May and we couldn't yeah. meet. I said, No, right. we, we're still very. Uh, relations are, are very frosty, so I'm so sorry. You know, you know, drive away yeah. and uh, being chased by a tornado all the way back home. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, Joey, you do have a, you should have a second career as uh, think about that doing stand up uh, impressions. You know, you you do that as part of your act. You you throw I'm in, in your the off. yeah, uh, yeah. You Blows watch on this heart of mine. Keep up <laughs> with a ball of twine, you know, that kind of thing. Oh, yeah, every once in a while. <laughs> we, used, we used to say Johnny Stash. Play it for me, Carl. Yeah. <laughs> Love that. I think Johnny Stash was that. Oh, oh, oh. Well, are there on YouTube, are there any uh, clips from Skittle Bits or High Noon? You know, people tell me that uh, they've seen the uh, uh, the videos of the uh, job occupations that we did. Like the Zamboni Driver is another one. <laughs> Zamboni. I to drive the Zamboni. Zamboni, what was a day tripper? God, I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm a Zamboni driver, yeah. And the bus video, climb yeah. aboard. I was like, <laughs> No need to worry. No need to fuss, right? The Beatles tune. And uh, you listen to that, and it was like, 55 cents is all you need. And you can chit chat or you can read. And now you get on the bus. What is it? Like a thousand dollars? I don't know. Oh, God. <laughs> Whatever. But it was kind oh, of good. need to go back. Uh, outrageous. Yeah, the are, are on. Uh, yeah. Some of them. Oh, cool. 
Yeah. I will definitely, I will definitely look into that. Well, uh, 1984 we mentioned this earlier. I want you to go into the story behind uh, "Love Will Bring It Together," not "Love Will Bring Us Together." The Captain <laughs> Anthony Hill song. Yeah. I want to differentiate between that, but tell the story how the about the song ended up transforming to "Together," the new wedding song. Okay, well, "Love Will Bring It Together." At the time, uh, a fellow by the name of uh, Peter Grant and John Cochran at CJOB asked if I'd like to go back in the studio and record a song for the Children's Hospital. I was the morning man at CHMM at that time. I said, sure. So I wrote, uh, the the producer was a fellow uh, that was so laid back, uh, uh, Craig. Uh, he was so laid back. He's like, okay, man, you know, that, you know, are you awake? You know? <laughs> are you here? <laughs> and, uh, he was great. It was just a super, super good ear, good producer. And so we're, I played Love Will Bring It Together because reggae was very big at that time. Uh, it was 1984, 85, somewhere in there. And uh, so uh, Craig Fotheringham said, uh, yeah, that, that's a good tune. We'll do that, you know, reggae. Oh, no, I'm sorry, you went. Yeah, man, it's, uh, <laughs> let's do that song, man. Okay, okay. Now we're, <laughs> we're, we're trying to find another song. Well, do we do a cover? Do we do whatever? And I said, you know, there was a song that I rewrote for for Brian, uh, Brian's uh, wedding in 1975. And we went through every song and his wife, at that wife to be at that time, didn't like this, didn't like that. You know, no, let's not do that. Let's. So I said, you know, you're not going to be happy until we write a song for you. So remembering the music of tomorrow, tomorrow on this road, right? I went, on this day, we stand together. And she went, oh, I love that. I said, good, because there's no such song. <laughs> no song. She goes, well, could you write words for it? So Brian and I sat down, and in about 25 minutes, we wrote, on this day, we stand together and pledge our love to one another. It came so easy. You know, oh, my darling, I will love you. From this moment, there will be no other. And it just, now together, together, right? So it just came, it just flowed. So I said to Craig, there was a song I rewrote and sang at my friend's wedding. And people were asking about the song at the wedding. And I also sang To Love Somebody. And I thought they were asking, they, they said, what was that song you sang? I said, oh, To Love Somebody. No, 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 not that, that, that together song. And I said, it got a kind of an interesting reaction. So I'll, I'll play it for you. And you tell me. So I played the song together, and now there's this awkward silence. Craig's sitting back, his feet are up. He goes, F man, <laughs> right? <laughs> F man, that's a hit. <laughs> so, we, we, this is where you come in. It yes. was the side. Yes, yes. Right. I'm going it together was the A side, uh -huh. and we sold every one of every one of the records that we printed, you know, or pressed for the children's hospital on Love Will Bring It Together. So I thought, well, that was a great little revisit to the recording days. Now, come the following May, uh, George McCloy uh, on CJOB was uh, the, uh, on the AM station, powerful uh, CJOB, it was a very powerful station. We were in the basement like, uh, can you throw us some crumbs, you know? Uh, <laughs> So George McCloy said, oh, here's a, here's a song by our, our uh, sister FM station, um, Joey Grerish, and uh, it's the wedding season. Let's see what this sounds like. Well, phone's off the hook. Now we have to press more records. You know, like, going yeah. it's great. Yeah. You know, there's more money. And that, you know, uh, and... We thought, okay, that's it. We presented the check and together had a great run. And all of a sudden, one day I'm sitting, I was talking to Peter uh, Grant and he, he said, uh, I, I think we, you've got a call from somebody in, in uh, Nip, is it Napian or Napian, Napian, Ontario? Uh, I, forgive me, I might be a wrong pronunciation. And um, I said, Who's that? He said, somebody from Sam, the record man. And so, oh, okay. So he said, hi, is this Joey? I said, yeah. He said, uh, we need a copy of your new record. 
Um, and I went, well, I haven't recorded since 1975 or even before that, you know. He said, no, your, your new song together, the wedding song, CFRA in Ottawa is playing it and the phones are ringing off the hook. And in a moment of insanity, I went, <laughs> tell them to pull that. That's that's just the local. Tell them to pull the. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Some problem. Because <laughs> we get people coming in the store and asking for it. Can you yeah. rent? Yeah. We sent, you know, a uh, hundred so records up together on CHMM Light Rock Records. So if there's anybody out there, it's a collector's item. CHMM Light Rock Records. We sent it to uh, Ottawa CFRA. And I thought, oh, that it's got to be over. Next year, hi, Joey, it's Jeff from Sam the Record Man. We need more product. Mm -hmm. thought, wow. Now that happened again. So we tried to get somebody interested, a record label interested. And Al Mare from Attic Records. Okay. Um, yep. Familiar with them. Yep. This song has something. We'll give you a one record release. Uh-huh. And, and it was probably one of the last 45 uh, one record releases ever done. And so he said, yeah, we, we, we'd like to take a chance and release it, whatever. And this was based on Sandy Davis uh, taking it down to Al Mayer. And um, so they released the song, uh, it, it, the wedding song, and the reaction was immediate. Uh, there was a radio station in Calgary where the woman was trying to find the perfect song for her daughter's wedding coming up. And she pulled off to the side of the road and wept because she finally found together. Yeah. Uh, you know, she went, my God, this is you know, perfect for my daughter's wedding. And it just took off from there. And in six months, uh, it was gold. Yeah. The interesting thing was Attic Records picked it up. I was still doing Skittle Bits in the Skittle Bits attic. <laughs> <laughs> attic? Attic, yeah. <laughs> that's so, eerie. Yeah, yeah it, it was kind of ironic. And in uh, in six months, it went gold. And that year, there were only four Canadian gold records. It was Brian Adams, Corey Hart, Glass Tiger, and Joey Gugore. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, on Good Rock and Tonight, which was a video show. They had, uh, I didn't have a video or anything like that. You know, yeah. it was. So they had a compilation album called Together. And I was on there. I was the lead song together. And then they had Dan Fogelberg and all these other people. And so the guy would just hold up the album cover going, and number 11 this week, without a video, number 11, Joey Gravish, who is this guy? You know, <laughs> that's It really went to number 11 with no yeah. video. Just yeah. yelled out. Yeah, here we go again, you know. So it, it's, it, it, it really, it's like down by the river. It's a bit of a fluke. But right. hey, we'll take it. We'll take it. It was a grace. It's still used at weddings to this day. Right, right. Well, I think that was definitely, uh, you know, master stroke uh, promotion on it, having it tied into a wedding song, you know. Yeah. Because it's for future weddings. Have you heard back from people that have played that at their weddings? Oh, yeah. 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 Once they're divorced. Yeah. yeah. That's a lot. <laughs> 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 the heartwarming thing is people did call, we're celebrating our 50th or we're celebrating our 40th yeah. wedding, and we used right. to get our wedding you know and, yeah. and i actually even surprised usually it was the, the 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 husband that would say would you surprise my wife at whatever you know and yeah we did a few of those over you know over the years and the, the one of the the, the heart uh, warming ones was there was a girl that watched Skittle Bits, and her mother wrote me a letter and she said she got this neurological disorder where she had to learn how to do things again. Her motor skills took a hit, and she and her friends abandoned her, but she said she considers you her friend, and you know could you call her? Could you talk to her or whatever? And I did. Uh, you know, I gave her a call and I said, hey, you know, you don't listen to anybody. You just be yourself. And, you know, it was a really terrific discussion. She was grateful. And years later, I sang at her wedding. Oh, is that something? Wow. Yeah. Oh, it was. And she was cured. I think she was well. And she got over 
but it, you know, here I am singing at this this little tyke's wedding who's now a woman. You know, it was uh, it was just so super heartwarming, and that's why we do what we do. What you do? That's right. That's right. Very true. Well, uh, a couple of other things I wanted to talk about real quick. Uh, you also recorded the children's album Bop and Rock with Joey. No, Skittle Bits yeah. Bop and Rock. And yeah. what we did there too is mm -hmm. we took uh, popular rock and roll songs and changed the lyrics. Um, like, can I trade? Can I trade my little sister for a baseball glove? Right? <laughs> she always, you know, <laughs> she always pulled my hair, you know. Uh, you know, <laughs> and can I trade my little sister for a baseball glove? And the kids would love that. Oobla dee, oobla da. We never change because the kids would sing that anyway. Oobla yeah. dee, oobla dee. This side is oobla dee, this side is oobla da. And they would say, how much is that doggy in the window? And then I wrote some originals. So one of my favorites on that album, which I think would fly with somebody like like an Irish Rovers group, was called Liza Little, and it's a, it's a great song. It, I, I was really happy with that, you know, because it kind of you could probably morph it into the adult market. It's about a classroom crush that we all oh. have, you know. Yeah. And uh, Liza Little's my favorite off that. And we, uh, I was honored in the fact that we we outsold uh, Fred Penner, uh, who was, you know, obviously in Winnipeg at the time. And we outsold him uh, with the uh, album, The Skittle Bits Pop and Rock. And he had, I forget what he had out of that time, but that was quite an honor too, because he was the mecca, kingpin of uh, children's entertainers. So right. uh, it was quite an honor, quite an accomplishment. Yes, yes, I would say so. Well, uh, whose idea was Sham Allen and the Dispersions? Uh, parody of Chad Allen and the Expressions, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, we, that is actually, that was a kind of a bootleg copy, but it was good enough that technically <laughs> we're with it. Sham, a bit. Allen. Sham yeah. Allen, I'm sorry, I'm still laughing. You know, I don't yeah. want to say it's me. Uh, so we, I said, how about Sham Allen and the descriptions? <laughs> yes. And that made the Guess Who's Coming Home uh, compilation with all these yeah. uh, bands and that. So yeah, I was yeah. And uh, the, the uh, our rock and roll historian, John Einerson, played on that. And he joins me and he's joined me in a couple of concerts and come on and played Shaken All Over because he did the books with Randy and Neil Young and you know, so he's still a friend and, and he loves to come and just play that because his first book was shaken all over. And uh, so he, he joins us as a uh, surprise guest and probably yeah. July 11th. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? It works. <laughs> well, who who did that first? Was it was it Chad? Yeah, Johnny Kidd and Johnny Kidd and the Pirates. That's what I was. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. And he died in a car, car wreck, didn't he? Johnny Kidd. Uh, believe he did I, i'd have to i'd have to look that up but i think he, he did a long time ago but then chad just passed away last november uh, chad. not too long ago he was a really nice guy really yeah. really super guy uh you know very uh very caring and nurturing about you know being in rock and roll and good advice and good singer too very uh like pleasant singer he, you could see where that was not going to work when burton joined the group it just was not going to work Right. Uh, and you know the, the the sound had to change because um, I couldn't hear Chad. American woman, stay. <laughs> it wouldn't work. It just wouldn't work. American woman. <laughs> more, more. <laughs> yeah, okay. it just wouldn't work. Say, you know, Chad, you know, I mean, obviously he left the group, and that's when you know shortly after that they had their biggest success with that. So. Yeah. The, the rest is history, as they say. Well, yep. um, okay, now uh, plug the event for my birthday. Uh, again, so thoughtful of you. Oh. Thank you so much, Joey. Uh, salute to the 60s. Joey Gregoresh, salute to the 60s. July 10th, just in time I'm for my birthday. Club Regent, and in your backyard, July 11th. Yes. Oh. <laughs> <Am> I, okay. <laughs> There's a P. 
there's a fee. <laughs> there is a fee. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's really the best place to go see a concert. There's not a bad seat in, in the house. Not a bad seat. It's a beautiful, beautiful venue. So July 10th, Club Regent. So Wednesday night, middle of the week in summer. So nobody's going to the lake in the middle unless they're already there. So we have <laughs> a really good time to do it. Tickets are going well. So uh, looking yeah. forward to it. I, and it's one magical night I'd like to revisit as I feel I'm back, you know, back in the city. Yeah, well, I think I think there's enough room uh, for maybe 50 people in my backyard, you know. So, uh, really how's that sound? Nervous. Yeah. Very nervous. What do you say? <laughs> oh, folks, come in, <laughs> grab a partner, and have a dance. <laughs> <laughs> to bring your harmonica to me, Stuart. Oh, I brought, I brought it right here, around. I'm gonna <laughs> give it to you, you know. Are right, you going to do the show again, Jimmy? <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, uh, I I did I did not know I did not know what was in store for me today, Joey. <laughs> but I I have thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, it's oh, been very I, inter, I, very entertaining, extremely I, entertaining. I, um, I send you a bill. I, I, <laughs> thank you. I greatly appreciate. It. You know, thank you for the interest and keeping sure. it keeping it alive, keeping all the music alive. Yeah. That's you know, what it's, it's about. very important to us, and we're all very grateful. Those of us that are still rocking, you, you right. know, we really appreciate it. So, thank you. God bless you, and you know, have, have a great life. <laughs>